Hello. Hello. Well, welcome to Senior Moments. And we're so glad that you came. Today we have Molly Nolte from the Rock County Council on, on Aging. She is the Mobility Manager. And we're so excited to have her here to talk about something that's really kind of important to everybody. Um, there, it comes a time in most of our lives when we have to think about whether we should continue to drive. And then you start thinking, what are our options? And what if? And oh my gosh, it goes on and on. So she's here to tell us how to make ourselves safe, to continue to drive as long as possible, and then what to do when we finally say no more. So we, let's give a nice welcome to Molly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Maureen, for that welcome. Uh, like Maureen said, my name is Molly Nolte, and I am the Mobility Manager for the Rock County Council on Aging. And mobility management is basically where I coordinate transportation and mobility options and solutions for senior citizens, people with disabilities, and low-income members of the community. So more or less, when folks can no longer drive or don't want to drive any longer, uh, I can come into the picture and show them how to get from point A to point B uh, most efficiently and um, most cost effectively. So I'll be talking about that today. And then in addition to that, I also work with uh, people who still do drive. I'm an ARP smart driver, um, a smart driver course instructor. So if any of you have taken that course, I know there's some people in the uh, audience today who've taken that course. Um, I, I'm one of those instructors as well. So what I'm going to talk to you all uh, about today is uh, how, how we change as drivers as we age, because let's face it, we're all changing as we age. So we will talk about some of those physical changes and mental changes. Um, we, we talk a little bit about kind of how roadways change and, and laws change and vehicles and, and all these changes and how they affect us behind the wheel. So um, once we talk a little bit about that, then I'll get into how we can assess ourselves as drivers, how we can be honest with ourselves when we're making those assessments. And then at the end of the day, if we ever get to that point where we have to say, okay, maybe it's not the best idea for me to be driving anymore. I'm going to give you a load of options of how to get around Janesville and Rock County as a whole without having to drive your own car, okay? Um, this is a great audience. Um, I had no idea we were going to have so many people. What a great turnout. I'm very excited uh, that you're all here. In the interest of time, I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes. Um, I'll ask everyone just to uh, refrain from asking questions during so we kind of don't get off track and go way over schedule. I'll reserve the last 15 minutes for questions, and then by all means, if anyone wants to stick around afterwards, um, certainly approach me and let me know if there's uh, anything else you'd like to ask. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. I have a PowerPoint that I'll be following along. Uh, I'm not going to read all the, the slides to you. They're more of kind of a reference, um, but I'd rather just talk to you today. Okay, so driving. Um, it, it's really all our culture. Um, in other places in the world, people don't tend to drive their own cars as much. If you think places like Europe and Asia, uh, they usually use public transportation, lots of buses and trains, trolleys, streetcars, um, subways, things like that. Um, inner, inner city Chicago, inner city New York, those folks are used to getting on the bus or, or getting on the subway and getting from point A to point B. We here in the Midwest, we're not used to that. We're used to having our own cars. Um, from the time we were 16 years old up until now, a car is a symbol of freedom. If you have a car, you can get behind the wheel and you can just go. Um, and, and that was the same even for me 12 years ago when I took my driver's ed. You know, as soon as you put those keys in your hand, you're, you know, that's freedom. That's the best thing ever. So um, there's kind of this stigma of public transit that we as Midwesterners have a hard time getting across because when we have to give those keys up, it feels like that loss of independence and that loss of freedom. So I understand why these conversations that we have to have can be really, really tough. If we have to have them with ourselves or with a spouse or another loved one, it's probably one of the toughest conversations that we're going to have to have in our lifetime about taking away those keys. I'm just going to hit you with a few statistics. They're super boring for the most part, so I don't want to uh, kind of dwell on statistics and numbers too much, but I would like to point out a few anyway. Um, this graph shows that uh, in the next just four years, um, 
we're going to be experiencing up to 40 million older adult drivers on the road. That's a very large number. Um, my generation, called the millennial generation, um, we're kind of getting away from the driving. A lot of people my age don't want to drive. They're moving to the cities and not owning cars. Um, but folks in the baby boomer generation and older, those folks want to stay behind the wheel as long as possible. So that's, that's a very large number of drivers in that age range um, out on the road in the next few years. Uh, this graph talks about crash involvement. So as you can see up here, uh, that shows crashes that young drivers get involved in, so your 16-year-olds that are just learning how to drive. Um, this isn't fatalities, but just crashes. So you can see what a high number that is for young drivers. But then you can see at the end here, once you start getting into that 65-plus range, that number just it starts to, to get an uptick again. Um, when we're in our 30s and 40s and 50s, we're really pretty safe on the road. Um, once we start getting older, that number does climb a little bit. And then, I'm not very good with this. Uh, this chart shows fatalities. And this is when the number gets pretty scary um, and kind of why I, I like to explain uh, these numbers to folks. So you can see again at the beginning of the graph with the young drivers, they're still getting in accidents and some of those are fatal. fatal excuse me. But if you look at that 70-year-old, um, it just jumps, it skyrockets. So for folks who are 70 plus who get into those accidents, those are the ones who tend to be fatal. And this isn't necessarily because older drivers are bad drivers. In fact, older drivers tend to be pretty good drivers because they have the most experience. They're not driving distracted. They're not making poor choices behind the wheel, like speeding and changing the radio station and applying makeup or what have you. Um, but when those accidents do occur, whether it's their fault or not, those tend to be the fatal ones. Why? Because we're changing. We're physically changing. You know, we, we'd be lying to ourselves if we didn't admit that the older we got, we're getting more frail. That's just, that's just nature. Our bones change and our minds and um, our eyes and flexibility. So when we get in those accidents later in life, they tend to be more dangerous. So this is just some information about really your generation, the baby boomers and beyond, about how uh, driving still tends to be the primary mode for older adults, especially in this area in the country where we don't have a lot of access or need for public transit. Um, driving, and this gets back to that independence, it, it maintains those connections for us. We can get to the grocery store and we can get to friends and to church and, um, you know, the doctor, whatever it may be. It maintains all of those connections. And then in addition, uh, at the bottom, I like to point out, um, if we ever experience that loss of mobility and if we don't find other options to get out and about, that's where things like the depression and the lower life satisfaction, the isolation, those feelings start to set in if we stop driving and we don't find another way to get out. Okay, so I want to point out that just because we're not driving doesn't mean you're going to feel that way, you know, but you'll have those feelings of isolation and depression if, if you don't seek a way to still get out and be social and get to the doctor and, and church and the things that you love to do. So I like to point out this other statistic because I think it's really important um, for us to understand that none of us in this room are alone. Um, they say um, that men outlive their ability to drive by six years while women outlive their ability by 10 years. So statistics show that we get to an age where it's just not safe for us to drive anymore, but we've still got a decade of life to live. Who wants to sit in their house and be shut in and alone for 10 years. That's why it's so important for us to recognize what those options are to still get out and about because chances are we're going to get to that point where we can't drive, so that's when we have to figure out what those options are. So one of the big questions you can ask yourself is when or how do I know when it's time to stop? And this isn't just something that you can ask yourself, but it's something that you can ask about the people around you, your loved ones, um, family and friends, um, whomever might be getting to that point in, in their lives, all of this information is going to be good. So we're going to talk a little bit about assessing our driving and how we're changing physically. This information is just about dementia specifically. Um, for those of you who might be a little bit familiar with dementia or Alzheimer's, um, people who are diagnosed with very early onset dementia still can have the ability to drive. It depends on what the doctor says. Um, dementia isn't necessarily 
um, you know, a diagnosis where you have to stop driving altogether, but it's something to keep in mind once that diagnosis happens. Um, definitely talk to your doctor and see if it's time to stop. So this is uh, visual changes. Uh, they talk about acuity, um, all these fancy words. I like to talk about um, how how our eyes change. Um, I think a lot of us wear glasses or contact lenses, but even if we don't, um, you need, this is an interesting fact I learned from the ARP Smart Driver course, you need 20 times more light at age 40 to see as well as you did at age 20. So in just 20 years, you need 20 times more light. So, and I, I don't know what the, the numbers are for people age 60 or 70 or beyond, but can you imagine how much more it jumps? So that's why you hear about people limiting night driving and things like that. Dawn and dusk get really tricky because you, your body physically, your eyes physically need that much more light to be able to see as clearly. So that's important to point out. <clears throat> Uh, contrast sensitivity, that means how well you can, you can see objects against uh, backgrounds. So for example, pedestrians or bicyclists, animals, um, road signs, things like that. Um, that's contrast sensitivity, being able to see those sharp images standing out against the background. Uh, peripheral vision, I like to point out, that's how well we can see out of the sides of our eyes and that naturally kind of um, uh, gets worse as we get older. Um, I'd like to just show you a quick little test. You don't have to do it here, but when you get home, if you hold your, your fingers out to the side of your body and then bring them in, as soon as you see your fingers, that's how well, that's how much to the side of your body you can see, and that's your peripheral. So if you're coming in here before you can see your fingers, might be something to think about, because if anything happens to the side of you in your car, um, you, you have to be able to see out of that. And in addition to just the way your eyes change, you have to be able to um, think, about, think about for a moment how, how driving is truly a full body experience. We might not think about that every day because you know, we've been doing it for so long, it's just second nature. But you use your eyes and your brain and your body and your feet, your wrists, your fingers. I mean, you use every single part of your body when you drive. It just kind of feels like sitting there and driving along. But when it comes to your eyes, not only do you have to be able to see well, but you have to be able to, to adapt. So you have to be able to look at your dashboard and then out the, the windshield and out the side windows and your mirrors. You have to be able to have all of that range. You have to be able to scan quickly. Um, I've heard of a lot of people having some issues as they age looking out the window and then looking down at their dash and coming back up and being able to, to focus again. So some of those changes are, are something that everyone should focus on. Another thing to mention about eyesight, of course, is to visit your eye doctor, your optometrist, um, annually. Um, when, you're, when you're younger, a lot of times um, every other year is enough, but as we age, um, once a year is, is better. This slide is about cognitive assessment, and cognition is just a fancy word for how well our minds work and kind of our uh, perception. So cognition when our cognition starts to change, and that can have to do with memory loss diseases like dementia, but cognition doesn't necessarily mean that you have a memory loss issue, but if you're finding yourself driving down the road and then all of a sudden you say, oh, I can't really remember where I was going or I can't really remember how to get to this place again, that, that might be a fluctuation in how well our cognitive abilities might be functioning. Doesn't mean that we have memory loss, it just means that there might be some gaps that, that naturally occur as we age. So this part is getting into that assessment that I had mentioned. Uh, there are formal driving assessments that everyone has access to. You can contact your local DMV or the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. Also, um, private driving companies like Drive Right and Rock Valley Driver School. Um, those are the formal driver assessments, and those are perfectly fine. But there are some simpler things that we can do that we can ask ourselves and assess before we do one of those formal behind the wheel uh, assessments. So. Um, Let's say that we're in a vehicle with a loved one that we've been having some, some concerns with about how well they've been driving. Um, you know, maybe you've noticed a couple fender benders, a couple dings and dents on their, on their bumper and you've asked them about it and maybe they can't remember how they got it. 
So perhaps if you're feeling comfortable, you could do an assessment with them without telling them um, while they're driving. So some of the things that you could assess, assess for them or for yourself is how, how is the decision making and route planning? You know, are we going somewhere that's two miles away, but it takes us five miles to get there? Uh, is it something where we could easily avoid the interstate, but we're getting on the interstate or vice versa? Is it something that is going to take us much, much longer to get there and we should get on the interstate, but instead we took the roundabout way? Not that there's anything wrong with that, um, but certainly is something to keep in mind if we're making some, just, just some questionable decisions behind the wheel as far as getting from point A to point B. That might be something that, that could be a red flag. Um, how are our lane changes? Are we using our blinkers properly or are we just kind of swerving into the next lane? Are we changing lanes without realizing we're changing lanes? Spacing. In the state of Wisconsin, there is a four second following distance. So that means that you're supposed to keep yourself at least four seconds from the car in front of you. And I'll paint a little picture of how to judge yourself or your loved one behind the wheel when it comes to spacing. So if you're driving behind someone and they pass a tree, it should take you four Mississippis to pass that same tree. And that's the state law in Wisconsin. So, you know, are we, are we riding people's bumpers? Are we giving, you know, way too much space on the interstate? Not enough. Um, just something to look at as far as spacing is concerned. Um, visual scanning, again, is how well you're, you're able to look around you and see between out the window and down to the dash. And then highway and interstate driving as appropriate. I'm the type of person, I don't like driving on the interstate, especially now that it's 70 miles an hour. I'm just not crazy about it. I'll do it when I need to if I'm, you know, going somewhere far away, I'll get on the interstate. But, you know, if you're with your loved one and we're just going a few minutes away and they want to pop on the interstate, probably not the best decision to make, so maybe, maybe that's a red flag too. So maximizing our physical, visual, and cognitive health, and there's a lot of things that we can do to maximize all three of those areas. So when it comes to our physical health, eating as healthy as possible and getting a lot of exercise. Um, as much exercise as your doctor says is good for you. Um, brisk walking, um, scientists have discovered that just half hour of walking a day can keep us uh, keep our cardiovascular health uh, well enough to, to keep oxygen pumping to our brain, keeping us physically and cognitively healthy. Um, stretching is very important, like I mentioned before. Um, flexibility has a lot to do, you know, with driving. When I back up, um, I don't like to just rely on my mirrors. I like to turn my whole body and look around. So if, I, if I'm losing that flexibility in my upper body and in my waist and in my neck, uh, I'm not going to be able to drive as safely. If, if, if I've got some issues maybe with arthritis in my wrists and my fingers, I might not be able to grip the wheel quite as tightly. So we have to think about um, doing things to keep us healthy and flexible and limber uh, to keep us safe behind the wheel because you need all of that functioning when you're driving. Um, and then visual, I had already mentioned, um, making sure that we get to our, our eye doctor uh, as often as we need to. Medications is a huge one. So they, they've said that one in three people um, are living with um, chronic diseases every day. A lot of people have two, um, two or more um, chronic conditions. A lot of us take medication, and a lot of those medications can affect the way we drive, and we might not even realize it. Um, always be checking our labels to make sure that the medication we're taking uh, doesn't say that it's going to affect our driving. I had a a gentleman in one of my ARP classes who said, well, I'm taking this medication and it says not to operate heavy machinery. Does that mean cars? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that means cars, all right. So he'd been driving, taking that medication because he was thinking like, you know, a combine or, you know, a, a steamroller, I don't know. But uh, he, he wasn't thinking car as heavy machinery, but it certainly qualifies. So uh, definitely taking a look at those labels, always taking your medication the way your doctor has prescribed it. And a lot of people don't realize this too, is even things like vitamins or over-the-counter medication, that can counteract with one another if you're taking different vitamins at the same time. Um, uh, vitamins can counteract with the prescribed medication that we take. So I like to give people two big tips. So number one is to always, always use the same pharmacy. So you want your pharmacy to be able to reconcile all the medication that you take. 
Um, you know, we've been hearing a lot of things in the media about these celebrities who take medications from all sorts of different doctors, and they all counteract weird with one another, and it ends up being really dangerous. And that could happen to any of us. If we're going to one doctor and one pharmacy for one thing, another doctor and another pharmacy for another thing, all of a sudden they don't know that we're taking this other medication, and it's going to affect us, our health, our cognitive response maybe, behind the wheel. Um, different sorts of disorders that people um, might be suffering from, such as diabetes or heart issues, these can affect the way we drive. If a person's having really high or really low sugar and they're behind the wheel of a car, it can almost be like being impaired by alcohol. So these are really important things to keep in mind. The second thing I like to um, tell everyone is there is a website and it's called roadwiserx.com. So R-O-A-D W-I-S-E-R-X dot com. What you can do is you can type in all the medication you take down to Tylenol or baby aspirin, vitamin C, calcium, plus all of your prescriptions, whatever it may be, and that website will tell you right away if any of those counteract with one another. So it's, it's a really handy um, website for a quick reference. Your doctor and your pharmacist are going to be the, the best bet for a first source, but Roadwise Rx is a really good second place uh, to check and just make sure. So it says, maintain a realistic perspective related to experience, ability, and the driving environment. And I think that's just a fancy way of saying, be honest with yourself. It's okay to look at a situation and say, am I fit to do this? Is this okay for me? Do I even feel comfortable behind the wheel anymore? Do I really want to drive anymore? It's okay to, to take a good look at ourselves and say, you know, let me be honest with myself. I don't think I want to drive anymore. The roads are crazy. Other drivers are crazy. You know, roundabouts are crazy. The whole nine yards. Maybe we just get to the point where we don't feel like we even want to drive anymore. And that's okay. It's all about being honest with ourselves. This is more about vision. It's a little bit out of place. But um, I'll just bring up um, some of the danger zones are crowded intersections, unprotected left turns, and then driving when stressed or fatigued. Um, roundabouts, like I just mentioned, those a lot of people don't, don't like those. Um, I've got some helpful hints on those afterwards if anyone wants to ask me, but I won't talk about that too much here. Um, and then the flashing yellow arrows, you know, as all those things change, um, we can adapt to them certainly, but if we don't feel like we want to adapt to them, there are other options. Uh, talking again about uh, staying away from night driving, um, dawn and dusk are really tricky. Night driving is really tricky, especially with those new headlights. I'm sure many people have noticed they're, they almost have a built-in glare to them. They kind of have that bluish light, that LED light. Um, those can be really tricky um, going down the road, especially if you're on the interstate with all that oncoming flashing that can be difficult to, to maneuver. Um, avoiding in-car distractions. Like I said before, older drivers tend to be the safest ones out on the road. You've all been driving for the longest amount of time. You've got the most hours behind the wheel. You're not texting. You're not putting on lipstick while you're driving. You're not changing the CD. You're not doing all those things that younger drivers tend to be doing um, when they're in the car. So you make the best decisions behind the wheel, unfortunately. If something does go wrong, that's when trouble occurs. So um, avoiding in-car distractions is always good advice. Um, planning ahead. This is something that most of us probably do on a daily basis anyway. Um, you know, We think about where we're headed to. We pick our route in our minds. We think about how we're going to get there on those daily errands. Now, if we're going somewhere a little bit farther away, we might take a look at the map or um, consult Google Maps and print off some directions. Maybe people have a GPS system or a smartphone that, they're, that reads them their directions. Um, whatever those adaptations might be, um, those are great. It's good to plan ahead. Um, it's good to, to have a route in mind or have your GPS set up, um, whatever it may be. Uh, always good to have atlases in the car just in case if your GPS runs out. Um, you'll, you'll still have a map in the car with you to help you out. Um, make cheat sheets. It's okay to make cheat sheets. Everybody uses cheat sheets. If you're going somewhere, even, you know, somewhere that you regular, let's say your elementary schooler has a, a Christmas sing or something like that, you don't always go to their school a lot, so just write a little cheat sheet for where their school is, and then if you find yourself in a moment of, I can't really remember how to get there, then you can pull that cheat sheet out and use it. 
So looking for driver opportunities, that's um, the, the driver assessments that are optional for you and then the ARP classes like the ones uh, I offer. There's a few ARP teachers here in Rock County. Um, there's one in Milton, one in Beloit, and then I kind of cover the, the Janesville area. So those are, those are a really great opportunity. Um, anything to kind of give you a refresher um, on driver's ed, it, it's okay to, to take a refresher. Things have changed a lot in the last 40 to 50 years. Um, cars are different and the roads are different and, and all these fancy new gadgets inside our vehicles and um, all of those changes. Um, so those driver opportunities are important to take advantage of. Uh, being proactive when it comes to your safety, again, that gets back to that being honest with yourself. If you feel like you're putting yourself at risk or maybe other people are being put at risk, uh, that's when we need to take that moment and be honest. I like to mention the program CarFit. Has anyone ever been to a CarFit event before? Um, Mercy and St. Mary's used to host them pretty regularly here in Rock County. Um, they haven't recently, but they have a lot of them in Madison. Um, they happen all the time in Madison. There are some CarFit uh, pamphlets in the back, but I'll just give you a summary of what the program is. Um, it's actually um, occupational therapist and then AAA, and they host these events where you drive your car in, and the occupational therapist has a checklist, and they go through the whole checklist with you, and they actually fit you in your car so you're in the safest position in your car. So your, your um, steering wheel houses the airbag, as many people know. So they, they make sure that your steering wheel is, is pointing towards your chest. They make sure that your headrest is in the proper location. So in the event of a crash, your head is supported. They double check your seat belt, your chair position, your feet position, um, and then offer alternatives if maybe you're not fitting well. Um, if anyone's vertically challenged like myself, um, they have, you know, they'll give you options for pedal extenders, things that will fit you properly in the car, so in the event of a crash, you're in the safest position. So like I said, a lot of those are in Madison, but um, the pamphlets are in the back and then on the ARP website as well. One more. Okay, so here's my little transportation alternative spiel, and this is really um, kind of the bread and butter of what I do as the mobility manager because for the most part I work with people who can't drive. Um, I'm sure that most of the people in this room still do drive, but when you get to that point, you know, there are a lot of options for you. Um, these are just a few that I have lift, uh, listed here um, on that back table, and I do encourage everyone to peruse and take as much as they want from those back tables, um, both for the transportation stuff and for the library's information. Um, but please do pick up this uh, kind of beige-colored pamphlet. It's called the Rock County Transportation Resource Guide. This has every single transportation resource in Rock County listed from the taxis in the area. Many of you might not know, but we've got several taxi companies in Rock County. Rock County Transit, which is uh, the county-funded transit program um, that shuttles people who are aged 55 and older or people with uh, disabilities. It's a shared ride service. It will take you anywhere you want to go in Rock County at any time, Monday through Friday, between 7 and about 4. So if you need to go to the doctors, the salon, a friend's house, the grocery store, wherever you need to go as long as it's in Rock County, uh, Rock County Transit will get you there. It is um, very competitively priced. Uh, round trips, if you stay within your community, for example, Janesville to Janesville is a $10 round trip. Janesville to Beloit is a $12 round trip. Um, if you compare that to other prices in the state, for example, Walworth County charges like $22 for a round trip. So we're very, uh, Rock County Transit's very competitively priced. It's good in a pinch, and then it's good to rely on um, if, you, if you get to the point where you're not gonna drive anymore, um, and if your family or friends or neighbors maybe can't help you out, it's a, it's a good, safe way to get anywhere you need to go in Rock County. Um, this also has Janesville Beloit Transit's information. I have a lot of Janesville Transit's information in the back. Uh, unfortunately, I don't, and I'm, I'm guessing most of you are probably Janesville folks, um, but for anyone from Beloit, I don't have their Beloit transit information because they are redoing their entire route system. So they actually stopped printing their route maps because they're redoing them in two months so they don't want to keep putting out the old information. So, but if anyone needs Beloit's, please do track me down and I will make sure to get you some. Um, some other options, has anyone heard of Uber and Lyft? Okay, so um, we actually have Uber in Janesville. 
Um, it's still, it's very, very small where it has started out. I think they just have a handful of drivers. But we do have Uber in Janesville. Um, I've used Uber a couple times in the Milwaukee and Chicago areas. Um, not, not some of the best stories on the news, but in my experience, um, it, it's been okay for us. Um, maybe as it gets kind of off the ground in Janesville, you might feel more comfortable using it, but just know it's an option out there. I don't know if Lyft is in Janesville now, but it is on its way. I just don't know if they've implemented it yet, but just keep that in mind, it's an option. Um, family, friends, and neighbors, what do we have them for if we can't ask for help, right? A lot of times people, um, they feel really uncomfortable asking their, their family and friends for help. Um, I hear from a lot of older drivers, you know, they don't like asking their kids because they feel like a burden. Well, then why'd you have us, you know? You can ask us for help, that's okay. Um, you know, that's what family and friends are there for. So um, by all means, ask away. And then volunteer driver programs, if anyone's aware, we have uh, a few volunteer driver programs in Rock County, actually. Um, one is called RSVP. That stands for Retired Senior and Volunteer Program, Retired Senior Volunteer Program, I think. Um, and they have the Seniors Volunteering for Seniors Program, and they just drive people around. So it's uh, senior citizens and um, retired folks who like to volunteer their time and their vehicles. And you can give RSVP a call, it's in this pamphlet, and they'll, they'll set you up with a volunteer. Um, they're a little restrictive because I don't think most people have wheelchair accessible vehicles um, like Rock County Transit does or like the buses do, um, but they'll, they'll take you anywhere and it's, RSVP is great because they'll go out of Rock County. So if you need to get up to Madison or down to Rockford or whatever it may be, they'll hook you up with a volunteer who can help you do that. So um, really great, um, they're in Janesville and Beloit, so they've got people who come from both cities. And then uh, for anyone who might be a veteran, there is the DAV, which is Disabled American Veterans. They serve non-disabled veterans, but um, it is um, called DAV. That information is here as well. Um, they exclusively take people um, up to the, the VA. So if you, if you or a loved one or a family or friend is a veteran and um, of, of any age, you don't have to be a senior. Um, just any veteran who might need some help getting to the VA, they'll take you up there free of charge. And then there is also, and I'm going to forget the name of it, FaithWorks. If anyone remembers Love, Inc., does anyone ever? Um, Love, Inc. is out um, of the community now, but it was taken over by a gentleman, and it is now called FaithWorks. Um, very new organization, but it's all volunteer. Um, they do some things like Echo does with the pantry and things, but... Um, FaithWorks also does transportation. I don't have that information here because they're so brand new, uh, but the next time these get printed, FaithWorks will be on here too. So just know that uh, that's an option for you. So I would just like to conclude um, just by saying that um, kind of the, the story that I always want to leave people with is, um, you know, we, we can't go through life and just think that we're staying the same. We're going to, our bodies are changing, our vision, and flexibility, and cognition. I mean, we're aging right now as we, as we sit and stand. So the most important thing is just to be honest with ourselves. Um, you know, think about how you feel behind the wheel of a car. Think about your family and friends or a close loved one who might be struggling behind the wheel of a car. Um, if you have to have that conversation with them or with yourself, um, you know, ap approach the situation with empathy and understanding and patience. Um, we don't want to come to a person who might be having issues driving and, and put them in a, in a space of blame and, and making them feel badly about anything. So it always has to come from a place of empathy and understanding. Um, those formal driver assessments are a really great way to, uh, to tell if we're still safe to be driving, talking to our doctor. Um, is a good way to tell if we're still safe behind the wheel of a car. And then if we ever do get to that point where we have to say, okay, enough's enough, and I, I don't want to have to drive anymore, um, just remember that Rock County is pretty special. We've got a lot of ways uh, to get you around town um, stress-free. You don't have to worry about uh, driving and speeding and distracted drivers and roundabouts. Uh, someone else will take care of that for you. So I'm a little bit ahead of schedule, but uh, let's go ahead and open it up to some questions. If any. Just a comment. Due to the re a recent incident, can you comment on the use of the flashing yellow turn lights? 
Yes, thank you for asking that. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so as many of you heard, there was that traffic accident last week involving the yellow flashing turn signal that happened by St. Mary's. Um, you know, that's one of those worst case scenarios. Um, it, it's one of those newer things that um, is kind of sweeping the nation and there was that communication breakdown that tends to happen, especially when it comes to road work and things like that. It just sort of was there. They didn't really tell anyone it was coming. They didn't explain to anybody how it was going to work, kind of like those roundabouts. It was just there and you have to just figure it out. So when it comes to the flashing yellow arrows, and I've got literature about that on the back table, so please do take a brochure if you don't already have one. Um, but what you do with the yellow arrow is you can creep out into the intersection um, and turn when it's safe to do so. So the oncoming traffic has the right of way. They'll have a green light. Um, you can almost treat it as though you don't have a yellow light or a yellow flashing at all, just a green light where you could creep out. Um, and, and uh, prepare for your turn when it's safe to do so. It's similar to that. It's giving, you, um, it's giving you permission to get out into the intersection. And as soon as that oncoming traffic has already passed through, then you can make your turn when it's safe to do so. Okay, that's a good question. And while we're talking about tricky driving situations, um, when it comes to roundabouts, because it's the bane of everyone's existence these days, um, the reason that Wisconsin implemented so many of the roundabouts so quickly, uh, my mom said it's because it was a stimulus package, that there was just a bunch of money sitting around and they <laughs> built a bunch of them. Um, but that's actually not true. So there, there was a 10-year study done by the, it's called NHTSA, I'm going to get the acronym wrong, National Highway and Transportation Safety Administration. Um, they did a 10-year study and they, and they tested out all of these different, different types of uh, driving situations and, and roadways and they found that uh, roundabouts were actually the most safe of all of these um, different uh, uh, roadway designs. And the reason being is because they eliminate or almost totally eliminate um, head-on and T-bone crashes. If you get in a T-bone or a head-on crash in a roundabout, um, you know, someone was doing something very, excuse me, very, very wrong. So if you have a four-way stop, those T-bones and, and head-ons happen a lot at, at four-way stops because I mean, you're facing traffic and other traffic is coming at you, um, you know, perpendicularly. So when you're in a roundabout, that's almost completely eliminated. So everyone's moving in the same direction. Um, they're not like the rotaries on the East Coast back in the 60s, but um, everyone is moving to the right. Everyone's going in a counterclockwise motion. All of the traffic will always be coming from your left. There'll never be a roundabout with a speed limit sign faster than 20. Most of the times it's 15. And so when you enter that roundabout, um, if you do get into an accident, chances are it's going to be a very slow speed glancing blow to the side. So those tend to be really minor accidents, um, you know, just a little bit of damage on the, on the side of the car. Of course, there are still accidents and there always will be no matter what. Um, but they, they found that with these roundabouts, they actually um, decreased the number of fatal crashes by 90%. So that was the reason why they implemented them. They're, they're not fun when you're first learning them. They're, they're intimidating, um, especially if you don't know that you're coming up to one. I've been in the situation where I was with a driver who'd never seen one before, and she panicked behind the wheel. And so, lucky enough, I happened to teach driver safety, so I knew how to kind of get her through it. Um, but it was my aunt, and she's from central Illinois, and they don't have roundabouts in the middle of cornfields out there. So, um, <laughs> but now she's seen a roundabout. Um, if you, if you want to know some really in-depth information about them, the Wisconsin Department of Transportation has a really great educational um, video. It's about 10 minutes long. Um, it really cleared up a lot of confusion for me as a driver. Um, if you go to the Wisconsin Department of Transportation, wis.com, I believe, wis.org perhaps, org, um, if you go to their website, um, they have that, that um, video up. It's very helpful because I hated them too and then I watch the video and I go, okay, I guess I get it, all right, I'll, I'll accept it, they're here to stay. So um, something else to think about coming, coming up um, is the diverging diamond formation. Oh, look at that, everyone's so excited. No one clapped, weird. Um, that's coming to the Avalon Road bypass area. Um, 
They, they have, I think they've improved on their communication skills a little bit with this one because the roundabout was so poorly received that I think DOT is kind of making an extra effort to get that notice out there and to teach people how they're going to have to maneuver it. I've never driven on one before, so I can't, you know, speak firsthand. But they've, they've been talking about bringing this in for three years now, and, and it's happening. If you've driven in that area, it's, it's under construction, so it's coming. Um, and that information, uh, the Gazette had a great article about it beginning of this week, I believe, or last week. Um, take the time, read the article, watch the video, um, you know, get acquainted with it, um, practice it in your head. And then the first time, if you ever have to go through it, have someone else with you, someone you feel really comfortable with in the car, you know, do some practice runs, anything it takes to, to feel safe uh, going through some of those, those new formations. Any other questions? We've got plenty of time. Go ahead. Is the cost to use the RSVP program still also $10 in Rockford? No, uh, RSVP is the volunteer, the retired and volunteer, retired and senior volunteer program. That's free. And yeah. are you, you are expected to tip the driver though? That's a good question. Um, I've never heard of anyone tipping. I don't know if they have a policy against it or not. Um, certainly if you call, I would ask that question. Um, I work with the um, Patty from RSVP a lot, and I've never, I, we've never had that conversation. So I'm not sure. M maybe, maybe they don't mind, or maybe they can't accept them whatsoever. But I would ask that question. Um, but they are volunteers; they're just doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They get they get um, gasoline stipends, so um, they do get a little bit back for the gas that they have to buy. Um, but they they just like volunteering for people. So take advantage of that uh, program if you if you feel the need. I think there has been a waiting list for it to get into that yes. program. Yes, yep, and that's a good point. She mentioned that um, there's a waiting list for RSVP, and uh, sometimes that does happen because state funding is what it is. It is a state-funded program. Um, they, they have had to cut some of their drivers. So um, the, there can be definitely a waiting list for it, but um, I've, I've suggested, uh, excuse me, to have people call and um, I think sometimes they can fit people in so still a still a good resource yes you had taxi service on your list. is that available on Sundays um, all of the taxi services we have in Rock County are all private pay um, I, it, it would depend on the company I, I haven't personally worked with any of the taxi companies uh, I would imagine that a lot of them run on Sundays. I believe Call Me a Cab out of Beloit runs on Sundays, and I think uh, You Buy We Fly runs on Sundays as well. I don't know about the two Janesville ones. Um, I think Edgerton Taxi runs on Sundays as well. Um, but if you need to use any of their services, I would definitely give them a call and ask. Um, since they're private pay, I would imagine if someone wants to pay them on Sundays, they'll get to work so they can get paid. <laughs> But uh, I would give them a call just to double check. Everyone's a little bit different. Um, and then I'd like to add, too, uh, just in case, uh, if anyone is on Medicaid and has any issues with Medicaid transportation, which has been a thing in the past, um, MTM, who is their broker, if anyone's familiar, if you ever have any issues with MTM, scheduling your rides or, or um, questions, uh, you can call Mobility Management, too. I've got some pretty good connections at MTM. We've been kind of um, smoothing things over for the last year because there were a lot of issues in Rock County uh, historically. So if you ever have any questions uh, or issues, call me so I can help you. Um, the school buses now, apparently, they're going to have flashing yellow lights. Mm -hmm. so you might want to touch base on that. Yes. Um, I've been told why they're doing that. Um, school, she, she mentioned that school bus lights are changing to flashing yellows, you know, for the life of me. I can't remember why they're changing that because I think they have yellow and red, right. where yellow means they're slowing down and then red means stop. Yeah, yellow is a warning that you're going to get a red. Okay. And you can't pass. Oh, okay. Whereas with the yellow <laughs> arrow, mm -hmm. you know, the yellow arrow, flashing yellow right. arrow, you can turn. I can see that when the school bus has a flashing yellow. That doesn't mean that you can pass mm -hmm. it carefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> When it comes to school buses, you know, a good rule of thumb is just stay back and wait until that stop arm goes. And the thing about, I used to be a 911 dispatcher, and, um, you know, as grandparents and parents, you can rest assured that the bus drivers in Rock County are the most, they are sticklers. The minute someone um, 
you know, does a stop arm violation, they get on the horn with dispatch and they let them know, you know, a white, you know, Taurus, license plate 123 ABC, just stop arm violation, you know, they, they've got it. So um, rest assured that uh, if anyone ever does that, they'll get called in pretty immediately. The James Hall buses do that. Mm -hmm. I imagine so. Because a lot of them did that when I've been on the bus. Mm -hmm. The, the James Hall will call in the people yeah. who go around the bus? Yeah, they will write the license mm -hmm. plate number and then they will call it in. Yeah. Because you're not supposed to turn in front of the right. bus. Right, right. No turning in front of the bus. Um, and then when it comes to school buses, I'm glad you pointed that out. But y yes, now that you say that, the the yellow lights, I think they're still going to be around the stop sign. Um, but the yellow lights mean prepare for a stop. Obviously, the, the red flashing and the stop arm means, you know, stay stay back until the child has crossed. So, um, Are you able to uh, take one of those small shopping carts on a city bus? Yes. yes. Yep. You are? Yes. Yep. Uh, James Lovelight. I, I have a big cart that I, that I take for um, to do my laundry. Mm -hmm. And then I have a small one that I take when I go grocery shopping. And you can, you, know, you can take both of them on the bus. Yeah, you have to carry them on, be able to lift them up though, right? Uh, well, they're on wheels. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the bus drivers um, in Beloit and Janesville tend to be really accommodating. Um, it, they're all equipped for wheelchairs and mobility devices. Um, there's a section on the front of the bus where um, that's for people in wheelchairs. But if you have one of the smaller shopping carts, um, the ones that kind of fold up and down, um, you can bring those on. They'll actually fold the seats up for you and then you can stow them there, just as long as they're not in the aisle or in front of an entrance. Like when I get on the bus with a cart, um, I have to, like people who have to get the carts out of the aisle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so in that little um, seat, <coughs> but with the wheelchair goes, mm -hmm. you push the cart in there to get it out. Yeah, just, yeah, as long as it's not in the aisle. Yeah. And then um, I should mention, too, that uh, part of um, mobility management, something that I do in the community is I teach people how to ride the bus. Um, you know, if you've never ridden the city bus before, um, if you're if you're wanting to try but you're feeling intimidated or unsure about it, um, I I'll sit down with you. We'll do a little um, we'll do an over the the phone interview just so I can know um, what city you're going to be traveling in, um, where you're going to be traveling from, and some of the most common places you'll be traveling to. So Walmart or St. Mary's or whatever it may be, um, and then I'll make up kind of a practice run for us, and and I'll go out on the bus with you free of charge, of course. And we'll ride that bus as many times as it takes for you to feel really comfortable and confident on the bus. So um, that information is on um, this beige one, too, my contact information. And then there's a pamphlet back there that just says mobility management. And the information is there, too. OK? Yeah, go ahead. Your address puzzles me, 51 South Main Street. I went out searching transportation a couple weeks ago. I ended up on Kennedy Road. And then I ended up on Centerway and Kellogg, and those also were council on aging places. Which, where were you trying to find? The council on aging itself? I was, tra I was tracking down transportation for a friend. Oh, okay. And so the first place I was sent to was on Kennedy Road. Okay. Um, it's near K&W. Oh, back down. Mm -hmm. There's um, And um, the other one was on Centerway and Kellogg. It's a, it's uh, ARC or something. Yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, oh, oh yeah. the AD, yeah, the Aging and Disability Resource Center, the ADRC, they're on 1900 Center Avenue in Janesville on the south side by Kellogg. They don't provide any transportation. No, they don't provide it, but I wanted information. Just information. And I they didn't know there were that many offices <laughs> in Janesville, and they're scattered all around. And th this is actually the courthouse's address, um, which, which is what I have to use for my business address. Our physical location, the Council on Aging and where Rock County Transit is housed, um, is um, kind of by the jail. We're out on North Highway 51 by 51 and 14. So that's my actual office and that's where Rock County Transit runs out of. Um, so if you need any of the physical information, um, the ADRC has, a, has all of our paperwork. Picked up all kinds of okay. places. Okay. But this, the 51 South Main is the Rock County Courthouse itself. 
Um, they have all of our information too, but I we had just, no idea they were there. You were there. We just had to, yeah. Uh, most people, the, the Council on Aging is in the same building as the Rock County Health Department, so where people get their flu shots and vaccinations. We're just a tiny little clump on the north side of the building. Nobody knows we're there. If you, you know, if you go to the health department, you don't even know we're in the same building. That's how small we are. There's only eight of us, so um, you blink and you'll miss us. But um, Why are they scattered around like that? It's a great question. <laughs> Um, Rock County is an interesting organization. Uh, we own a lot of property all over the county. Um, I mean, health or human services, I believe, they're in like six different locations all over the county. Um, the ADRC, the, the Aging and Disability Resource Center and the Council on Aging, we work together a lot, but we're not considered the same. Um, that merge might happen eventually, but for right now we... It would combine offices and maybe cut down on our taxes. <laughs> well, and that's interesting that you say that because the building that I'm located in is actually paid off, which is why they, they want to move us to the job center so we can start paying rent. So, <laughs> but these are all politics I don't get paid to understand, so... Are there any other questions? But you're saying those three are separate agencies, the ADSC and the... The, the ADRC and the uh, Council on Aging, we're all Rock County. We just kind of perform different duties. So family care and long-term support and people who do case management, that's all the ADRC. And then we do, um, what, what we do in the Council on Aging is uh, mobility management, Rock County Transit, um, all of the, the healthy eating programs for older adults, um, the Meals on Wheels, um, not the Beloit ones, but we do the home delivered meals, we do the, the senior dining, um, the nutrition sites is in, that's in our building too, and then um, caregiver outreach and support, and the elder benefit specialist. So that's, that's all we do. So we're, we work together closely, but we do have different duties. Do you have the Meals on Wheels program where you come into the homes from the, the, from the dining, the, the Council and Agents mm -hmm. Dining Program? Yep, we do. Uh, Beloit has their own Meals on Wheels program, but we deliver to the whole county as well. Um, and there's, there's some information back there, too, about, um, uh, I think it just says services, um, Council on Aging Services or something like that. But I can show you in the back. But um, we do, so they do um, all of the nutritional sites, like at the Gathering Place and the... Um, uh, the one in Jane Janesville. Um, yes. Um, so, so all the places that serve seniors um, Monday through Friday. And then this, those same meals get taken out into the community and served to people who are homebound. So that's something else that Council on Aging does. But Meals on Wheels in Janesville is handled through Mercy Hospital. Huh? Yeah, and there's some different, yeah, I, I shouldn't have said Meals on Wheels because that's not our program, just similar. But yes, there, there are some different places that do different things. Um, but we go out into the county. Um, for folks and everyone kind of qualifies differently and the money comes from different places so um, yeah it's just another one of our our things that we do anything else any other questions okay well uh, again just feel free to peruse those um, back tables a lot of really helpful information if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask me personally away from the microphone they can come up here and ask me I'll stick around for as long as I needed thank you everyone so much Thank you, Molly. I also just wanted to let you know if anybody is interested, we right here at the library sell bus tokens and with the uh, senior discount. So we sell a packet of 10 for I think it's like $8.40. I could be a little few cents off on that, so don't, you know, like hold me over the fire for that, but it'll be close. So please enjoy. The water is finally hot. So you can make coffee or tea. There's water back there. Please get lots of information. Thank you all for coming. And don't forget, next month, we will be having Laura Dahl come in talking about downsizing with ease. So, and that's not our physical body. So don't worry. Nobody's going to be putting you into an exercise class. Thank you.